de conformidad con el artículo 303 del Código de Procedimiento Penal, al capturado se le hace saber sobre el hecho que se le atribuye y el motivo de la captura y el funcionario que la ordenó. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to today's video. Today, we're going to be talking about what happened to seven-year-old Juliana Samboni. This very heart-wrenching and just tragic case happened in Colombia and it was widely talked about because the person who did this, you know, the person that murdered Juliana was very well known. He was wealthy and he came from a very well-established family. So the case just exploded in the media. People from Colombia have said that Juliana's death has stuck with them since the day it happened and to be honest it has stuck with me since day one of researching this case because what happened to her just truly makes you question humanity it just makes you question everyone it's just sick what happened to her you guys like I am just gonna put a trigger warning because what we're gonna be talking about in today's video is absolutely distressing you know it's definitely a difficult video to talk about but it's also very important to spread awareness on what happened to Juliana it brings up such an important conversation about injustice about how wealth can help you get away with a crime. One reporter named Ernesto Cortez from the news El Tiempo Colombia described the case in this way. He said, quote, This case became so talked about in the media because it's a typical soap opera story where a rich man takes advantage of a poor girl, kills her, and then justice is made. That's the perfect soap opera story. There have been other cases like this in the country, but they aren't as talked about because they have happened in remote zones with not so soap opera worthy protagonist end quote basically saying what i just told you guys i mean the reason that this case blew up so much is because juliana's killer was such a wealthy man that came from such a wealthy family and i'm telling you it's just a lot with that let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to juliana juliana andrea samboni muñoz was born on june 26 2009 in el cauca colombia to her mother nelly muñoz and to her father juvencio samboni juliana also had a younger sister named nicole the Samboni family belonged to an indigenous ethnic group called the Yanocanas. In their hometown of El Cauca, the Samboni family really wasn't making good money and they actually lived in a house with 15 other people. Juvencio knew that this isn't what he dreamed for his family. You know, he wanted them to have their own home. He wanted his daughters to grow up well with everything that they needed. He just knew that he wanted a better life for his family. So when Juliana was five years old, Juvencio moved the family to Bosque Calderon, Bogota. This very humble area which was inhabited by working families was just behind an area that had a lot of wealth and this wealthy area was called Chapinero Alto. Now this area had nicer homes, it had lots of restaurants and bars to go to, places to shop at, you know it was just like a nicer area where people just didn't really struggle. People have described it as almost dystopian, you know that such poverty can exist right next to a very wealthy place. So in this new city, Juvencio got a job working in a construction company that gave the family, you know, a sense of stability. It wasn't much, but he says that with this better wage, his family never endured hunger and he was actually able to buy his daughters things that they wanted, such as toys and costumes. Juliana's mom, Nelly, also worked cleaning homes. Other family members also followed them to this new city and made the move in search of a better life. They were all working together at these jobs and, you know, because the families followed Juliana and her family, she got to continue playing with all of her cousins and, you know, growing close to her family. Juliana's father speaks so fondly of her and says that she was a very happy girl who just loved her family. She loved to play different things, you know, such as doctor, nurse, princess, and queen, which I'm sure many of us did as children. I remember growing up, like, I was obsessed with playing princesses with my sisters and my sisters would play teachers and doctors as well. So it's just very cute that Juliana had that memory with her sister and with her cousin. For Halloween, Juliana asked her father to buy her a princess costume and a crown and she would always wear it around the house and just pretended to be royalty with her sister Nicole. Juvencio says that ever since she was a little girl, she wanted to become a doctor or a nurse and, you know, because she wanted to do this as her job when she got older, she would kind of like play with people and she would like go up to them and like touch your forehead to see if you had like a fever or just like pretend to treat you. Which I thought was just like such a cute thing. The fact that she would just like go to see if you had a fever and just like make sure 
sure you were okay. Even though it was all pretend, it's just very adorable. Everyone said that Juliana was just so happy to have her sister and her cousins to keep her company in her new home and they were always all just playing together and like I mentioned, they were all just very close. Things honestly seemed to be going well for the family. You know, the family was working hard to save up to buy a house for themselves and their children were happy. Nelly actually became pregnant and they were expecting a boy. Juliana and Nicole were now going to have a baby brother. Everyone was just so happy about this. I mean, their family was growing. They were living in this new town. They were, you know, working hard to, you know, build a future and everyone was just so happy at this point. But unfortunately, everything would change for the family on Sunday, December 4th, 2016. That morning at around 9 a.m., seven-year-old Juliana was outside of her home playing with her six-year-old cousin when suddenly a man in a vehicle approached them. This man stopped the car, opened the passenger door, and asked Juliana and her cousin to get closer because he was lost and needed some help finding directions. He was actually holding a piece of paper and was motioning to Juliana and her cousin to like look at the paper. At first, Juliana and her cousin didn't really listen to this man. They were kind of just a little bit, you know, put off by this man. But this man just kept insisting that they get closer and closer to the car. And after so much persistence, Juliana listened. She ended up approaching the car and in the blink of an eye, she was actually snatched by the arm and by her hair and forced inside this car. She tried to get loose, you know, she tried to fight, you know, get out of the car, but the man hit the gas and fled before Juliana could free herself. Now, her younger cousin saw this entire thing go down. You know, her younger cousin is just standing there watching his older cousin get kidnapped and he's just like, what the heck just happened? And of course, you know, this cousin is only six years old, so there really wasn't much that he could have done to help her. As soon as this happened, you know, as soon as the car fled away, he ran inside the home yelling, they took Juliana, they took Juliana. Nelly and Juvencio hear the screams and they quickly run outside to see what was happening and they run outside trying to look for her. The cousin told Juvencio that the man who took her looked young, that he had a beard, and that he drove a silver car. Now, there was only one entrance and exit to this neighborhood, so the family figured that someone must have spotted this car or that maybe this car was still on its way to the exit and that they would have enough time to catch up to it. So Nelly and Juvencio began running around the neighborhood. I mean, Nelly was running and yelling that someone took her daughter. She was alerting the entire neighborhood about what had happened. Now, keep in mind, at this point, she's almost at her due date and she's running around looking for her daughter when she should be resting and preparing for the birth of her baby boy. Nelly and Juvencio kept looking all around the neighborhood, but it was too late. The vehicle and their daughter was gone. They quickly went back inside their house and they called the police right away. Now, thankfully, police actually listened to the family and they began searching for Juliana immediately. I say thankfully because as you guys know, it's a pattern on this channel where, you know, police do not take missing children slash adult reports seriously. But in this case, thankfully they did. It should be like this in every case, but unfortunately, the reality is that it's not. So when police arrived at the neighborhood, neighbors said that they actually had seen that silver car pass by the neighborhood in the last few days. So today, December 4th, wasn't the first time that they had seen this car. Because the car had passed by a couple of times, they weren't able to remember it because of its nicer characteristics compared to the other cars in the neighborhood. So they knew that this car probably didn't belong to anyone in this neighborhood, but that it most likely belonged to someone from the wealthy city next door. Police were speaking with Nelly and Juvencio, and they were asking them things like, you know, if they had any enemies that would want to get revenge on them, and, you know, they were trying to just, like, dig and get any helpful information Information that could help them find Juliana but you know Nelly was actually fainting very frequently during these interviews and she was barely able to speak because again she is pregnant she's about to give birth to her baby boy and now she's dealing with the abduction of her little girl this is just every parent's worst nightmare thankfully the neighbors were very helpful and they were spreading the word to everyone they knew about Juliana's disappearance and some local taxi drivers were also helping and they were spreading the word to keep an eye out on a gray vehicle through their radios and and WhatsApp groups. Thankfully, a neighbor was able to write down the license plates of the car, and thanks to a bakery around the corner with surveillance footage, police were able to find the owner of the vehicle. The owner of this silver Nissan X-Trail with plates DBO960 belonged to a woman named Laura Arboleda. Police immediately sent out an alert to help look for the car and told everyone to not let this car leave the city. In the meantime, police actually tracked down Laura and they called her 
while she was actually at a bazaar with her children and with her husband. So Laura picks up the phone and police tell her that they are in search of her vehicle because it is associated with the kidnapping of a little girl. Now Laura is listening to this on the phone and she's like, what the heck? Like, what are you talking about? And she tells police like, yes, the car is under my name, but I have no idea what is happening. Let me pass you to my husband. So she passes the phone to her husband, Francisco Uribe Noguera. Francisco answers the phone and very defensively says, don't call again. This is probably some sort of scam. I'm hanging up. And he literally hangs up the phone. Now, something important to note is that Francisco is a very well-known lawyer and he also belongs to a very prestigious and wealthy construction family. His family owned multiple properties and just like multiple apartment buildings in Bogota. So Francisco hangs up the phone and police are like, um, no, that's not happening. And they immediately just call him back and tell him, no, this is a real situation. We need to search the vehicle. Please meet us at the police station so we can further speak to you. And at this point, Francisco's like, okay, I guess something serious is actually going on. And he tells police that he doesn't have the vehicle with him, that it's actually parked somewhere else and that he can't get to it right now because he's at this event with his family and with his children. Police tell him that they have media outlets at the scene and that if he doesn't tell them exactly where the car is in the next 15 minutes, the story will be all over the news and everyone's going to know that this, you know, wealthy lawyer from this prestigious family is being investigated in the abduction of a child. So Francisco tries to calm down the police and is like, okay, okay, calm down. Give me a few minutes. Let me make some calls. So he hangs up the phone and while police are waiting for Francisco to call them back, police search up Francisco on social media and they find a photo of someone on his page that matches the characteristics of the man driving the vehicle. The man who abducted Juliana. Police show this photo to the neighbors who saw the man and they said that, yeah, he is very similar and that this could be the man that was driving the vehicle. So now police had another clue. A few minutes passed and police had still not gotten a call back from Francisco. So they called and called him back, but they received no response. So even though they did not hear back from Francisco, police had already told him, you know, you need to meet us at the police station because we need to talk about why your vehicle was associated with an abduction. Luckily, Francisco did listen to them and he actually met them there as he was told to do at around 2 p.m. And police just reiterated to him the importance of finding his vehicle as soon as possible. Francisco made another call and appeared to be very nervous and worried. And then he told police, I'll be frank, the car is under my wife's name, but we gave it to my brother. We haven't changed the ownership paperwork. So police are like, okay, well, who is your brother and where is he? We need to find him. And Francisco goes on to tell them that he will take them to where his brother lives which is at an apartment building that the family owns in the wealthy area of Chapinero Alto. If you recall, I mentioned at the beginning that Juliana's neighborhood and this wealthy part of Chapinero Alto were pretty close in distance. So... Who is Francisco's brother? His brother is 38-year-old Rafael Manuel Uribe Noguera. He is an architect who graduated from a very prestigious university, and according to his ex-classmates, Rafael was an aggressive guy who loved to do drugs, he loved to drink, he loved partying, and he loved to hire prostitutes. Despite these, you know, very questionable characteristics, he was actually a very popular guy and he had a lot of friends. So... Police and Francisco make their way over to the apartment building where Rafael lives called EQ64 and they look for him but he's not there nor the vehicle. So police are trying to get access to the building surveillance footage just to see if they can spot you know Rafael arriving with Juliana or just to see if they can find any evidence. While police are busy searching the apartment building and you know trying to get the surveillance footage Francisco actually gets a call from his sister named Catalina. At this point Francisco had already contacted Catalina and told her, you know, everything that was going on about how they needed to find Rafael as soon as possible and how he was possibly involved with an abduction. So Catalina's on the phone and she tells her brother that she's at the vacant apartment building that their family also owns, which was just a couple of blocks away from Rafael's apartment that the family owned, as I mentioned, and was being prepared to be rented. I know it gets a little bit confusing, but this family just has so many properties. So right now, Francisco is with the police at Rafael's apartment, which was at Q6 
64. That's like the building name, right? So Francisco's there with the police trying to find Rafael. And meanwhile, their sister Catalina is at another building just a few blocks away that the family also owns. And it has like a penthouse at the top of the floor where the sister believes that maybe Rafael could be hiding. So Catalina is at this penthouse trying to get access to the building. But she tells Francisco that the security guard, 58-year-old Fernando Merchan Murillo, isn't letting her go up to the penthouse where she believes that Rafael could be. The security guard just kept telling her that no one could go up there and that Rafael wasn't there. Francisco tells his sister, you know, what do you mean he isn't letting you up? We own the building. Tell him that this is a serious situation and that you need to go up there right now to find Rafael. So through her persistence, she's led up into the penthouse where she thinks that her brother Rafael is. And as soon as she starts to approach the front door, she can smell cigarette smoke coming from inside. She starts knocking and knocking on the penthouse door, but no one answers. She was so sure that her brother would be hiding in there because if he wasn't at his own apartment, this would be the only other place that he would be at. So Catalina stays there trying to figure out what to do, you know, where her brother could be. And at the same time, Francisco actually sneaks away from the police and he goes to the penthouse apartment building at around 3.42 p.m. and he's basically met with the same problem. You know, the security guard didn't want to let him in, but again, through persistence, he gets in the building. When Francisco asks the security guard where the car that Rafael was driving is, the security guard tells him that it is in the basement parking garage. So Francisco makes his way to the basement parking garage, he finds the car, uses a spare key to unlock it, and inside, he finds the shoe of a little girl. So a red flag immediately goes off in his head and he said that in that moment his world just flipped upside down. He said that he was, you know, initially, you know, relatively calm looking for his brother since it was pretty normal for him to not answer his phone and to like kind of be MIA because he did actually have, you know, drug and alcohol problems for the past 15 years. He was honestly just thinking like, yeah, my brother's probably like on a bender. He's probably like MIA, like doing drugs somewhere. I didn't really think that his brother did anything bad, but now when he looked in his brother's car, and found a little girl's shoe everything changed he just knew that something bad had happened despite these feelings he doesn't call the police to let them know that he found the car and that he found a little girl's shoe which is crazy because police were literally telling him like hey we need to find this vehicle because someone spotted it abducting juliana so instead of calling the police letting them know that he found the car he just ends up going back up to the penthouse and starts banging on the door but again no one answers the front door so he tells catalina to hold on and he actually decides to climb up to the roof and get access to the penthouse from the balcony and open up from the inside He's actually seen on surveillance video climbing over the wall and, you know, like, breaking in. According to Francisco, when he finally gets inside the penthouse, he searches all of the rooms, but finds nothing. He does, however, see that the place is covered in oil, there's cigarette butts all over the floor, that there's a half-empty bottle of alcohol, and that there was coke on the counter. Now, as he's looking at all of this, you know, looking at this, like, crazy scene, through the corner of his eye, he actually sees a shadow, and as he turns around, he sees his brother, Rafael, on the balcony in shock, confused, overdosed on drugs, drunk, and it appears as if Rafael was trying to jump off the balcony. Francisco immediately ran and he aggressively grabbed Rafael by his arms from behind and he pushed him up against the wall and began yelling horribly at Rafael, saying things such as, what the F is wrong with you? Where is the little girl? That girl is the same age as my daughter. Where is she? What did you do? And he basically just demands that Rafael tells him exactly what happened, but you know, he says that Rafael was just so out out of it and that his eyes just looked so different, that his eyes were very red and that he felt like he wasn't even talking to his brother. You know, he didn't even recognize who this person was. He says that Rafael was just very shaky and that he just kept telling his brother that he didn't want to be alive. Francisco is still like shaking him and trying to get sense into his brother, but Rafael just tells him just like a bunch of different things such as, Oh, Juliana jumped out of the car as I took her. She exited the car on her own and he just kept saying stuff that just like didn't make sense. All Francisco wanted was a straight answer from his brother, but he just couldn't get it. So out of frustration, he actually kicked the wall out of anger and he went to go open the penthouse door for their sister Catalina, who is still outside of the apartment door, just like waiting to be let inside and can hear her brothers fighting and screaming inside. At the same time, the security 
guard Fernando arrives at the penthouse door and asks him if everything is okay because you know even from all the way in the lobby he could basically hear all of the shouting and the fighting that's when Rafael just like quickly popped his head out briefly and said that these are his siblings and that everything is fine so the security guard Fernando just leaves it alone now Catalina Francisco and Rafael are all inside the penthouse and the siblings are just crying and they're just very frustrated trying to get an honest answer from Rafael but again he's just telling them a bunch of different versions and just telling them things that doesn't make sense okay I had to pause for a second because it started raining outside so if you guys hear like drizzling and like weird noises it's because it's literally pouring rain right outside my window okay going back to the case Catalina is frantically looking all over the penthouse for any sign of Juliana now they see the condition that Rafael is in and they just realize how chaotic the whole thing is and Francisco decides to actually call a colleague for legal advice and tells a person I can't think this situation is happening will my wife be involved since the car is under her name Rafael is telling me he was the last person to see Juliana Francisco and this colleague talk for a bit and then Francisco and Catalina decide to take Rafael to a clinic at around 5 30 p.m by taxi because again at this point he's very drunk and they honestly believe that he is on the verge of overdosing so they wanted to take him to a clinic just to make sure that he was okay while on the way to this clinic Francisco tells Catalina that she really has no reason to be here and that he'll take over from here and that she should just go back with her kids who are alone. Francisco says that when they continued driving after Catalina got off the taxi, all he could think about was how his day went so south. I mean, in the morning, he was at this bazaar with his family buying Christmas gifts. And then the next thing, you know, he's dealing with this entirely chaotic situation. He's trying to find his brother. He's trying to find this little girl that's missing. I mean, he was just like, what the heck happened to my day? And like, how did we end up here? Now, at this point, police are wondering what is going on, you know, because they still haven't found the silver car. They still haven't found Rafael. And then Francisco pretty much just like snuck away from them while they were at Rafael's apartment looking for him. And, you know, more importantly, they still have not found Juliana. So police call and call Francisco, but he doesn't answer. And police don't hear from him until around 6 p.m. So from around 2 to 6 p.m., police had no idea where Francisco was and they had no word from him. At around 6 p.m., Francisco calls the police and tells them, hey, I found my brother. We're actually taking him to a hospital because he overdosed on drugs and he drank too much alcohol. I'll meet you guys there. So police make their way to the hospital and when they get there, they are met with Francisco and his lawyer. Francisco tells them, my brother confessed in the car right here. Rafael told me that he kidnapped this little girl, that he did kill her and that she's in the machinery cabinet below the jacuzzi on the penthouse patio of EQ66, which again is the building where the penthouse is and then an EQ64 is where Rafael's apartment was. So police tell Francisco that he has to go to the penthouse with them to help, you know, guide them and like show them around. So they all arrive to the penthouse and this is when they are met with just a horrible scene. And I do just want to put a trigger warning for what comes next because it is a very, very hard thing to listen to. At around 7 p.m., police and forensics arrived at the penthouse. Forensics went upstairs to the penthouse while, while police stayed downstairs with Juliana's father, Juvencio, who was just an absolute distress because so many hours had passed since Juliana was taken. And, you know, he was saying that they had probably already taken his daughter out of Colombia and he was just so worried. So while police are downstairs in the lobby with Juliana's father, you know, trying to keep him calm, forensics is upstairs in the penthouse and as they were looking around, they ended up finding Juliana's body. She was inside the machinery cabinet of the jacuzzi, naked, smothered in vegetable oil with bite marks on her face, marks on her body, strangulation marks on her neck with her arms folded over her chest holding her underwear and she also had a red bow tied around her torso. I swear reading that just made my stomach drop. It honestly made me feel sick. That's just disgusting. Like what the heck is wrong with people? I just don't even understand. There's like no words to describe how horrendous this truly is and I just can't imagine what Juliana's last moments were and how frightened and how confused she must have been. He not only took her innocence away in such a cruel manner but he also took away her dignity when he placed that bow on her as if she was his prize or a present, you know, a gift for himself. When forensics saw this, they honestly believed that they were looking at some sort of sick ritual. So they find Juliana's body and then call the police downstairs in the lobby to inform them. However, police didn't tell 
Juvencio right away. Instead, they told him that they needed to go get his wife, Nelly, and then all go to the police station to speak together. Once at the police station, they were told the devastating news. Juvencio yelled at the police because he was like, what the heck? You knew my daughter was dead, but you let me ride in this car with you. You let me come all the way down here while you knew the whole time that my daughter was not alive. So he was upset that police knew, but didn't tell him sooner. As for Nelly, who was about to give birth any day now, she fell to the floor after hearing that her daughter had been murdered and after hearing the horrific and just terrifying details of what happened to her. Out of anger, she actually began hitting herself and, you know, pulling her clothes and screaming, saying that she just didn't want to be a mom again. Both Nelly and Juvencio were crying so much and just screaming and they were fainting and just... It was a horrible, horrible scene and my heart just breaks for the family. I just, no one deserves to go through something like this and it's just so unfair that this man just took her life away and just ruined so many people's lives. Since Juvencio and Nelly were crying and just fainting and just were not doing well, they were actually taken to an urgent care clinic. Juvencio was screaming, saying that he fled his hometown in search of a better life and that now this horrific thing was happening to his family. This was just their worst nightmare and they were just wondering, you know, how could this have happened and why did this guy do this? While Juvencio and Nelly were at the hospital, police returned to the crime scene with forensics to gather more evidence. They ended up finding Juliana's clothes and one of her white shoes and a plastic bag inside the toilet tank. Not only were her clothes there, but other female clothing that wasn't Juliana's was found as well. This means that Rafael could be responsible for the disappearance of other young girls or of other women. When I read that, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, like this guy probably has done stuff like this before and this was just the first time that he was caught. Juliana's pink bracelet was also found at the apartment and Rafael's black jacket. The penthouse was covered in oil all over the floor and they also found a bottle of vegetable oil, the same oil that Juliana was smothered in. They also found a lot of cigarette butts all over and a half-empty bottle of alcohol like Francisco already saw. It also appeared as if someone had tried to clean the penthouse and forensics said that the crime scene had been manipulated. In the car, they found Juliana's other shoe in the passenger side of the vehicle, which again, Francisco already saw but didn't report. There was also a key person who they interviewed and it was actually the security guard of the building, Fernando Merchan Murillo. He was a guard on shift that day and when police interviewed him, he said that yes, Rafael arrived and then later in the day, his sister arrived to look for him and then Francisco came along and also looked for him. I mean, pretty much Fernando said everything that I already told you guys. He actually had everything written down on his notebook. You know, he took logs of everything that happened, everyone who entered the building and he was just like on it and told police exactly, you know, what time everybody arrived, what time everybody left, everything. So let's regroup and let's look at what police had. They had a suspect, Rafael. They had finally found Juliana's body. They had her clothes. They had her shoe. They had the surveillance footage of Francisco climbing over the balcony. And they also had a witness to all of this, which we will actually get back to him shortly because, wow, this case just doesn't end. Like, as soon as you think, like, wow, this is like the worst thing ever, it just gets even worse. Now, Juliana's autopsy revealed that she suffered a lot before her death. And again, I'm just going to put another trigger warning. The person that conducted her autopsy said that they were not expecting this level of severity and this level of violence. It also wasn't the easiest autopsy to conduct because again, she was just smothered in vegetable oil. Forensics just didn't know if this was like some sort of sick fetish that Rafael had or if he had smothered her in oil to erase any trace of him and like erase any type of evidence. She was only seven years old and Rafael is a 38 year old full grown man. Juliana's autopsy revealed that she died sometime between the moment that she was abducted and 3 p.m. She was violently essayed. She had blood and trauma on her private areas. She was beaten, bitten on her face, and her cause of death was mechanical asphyxiation, suffocation, and strangulation. As for the bite marks, forensics say that it is a six-second 
behavior. Her autopsy also revealed that Juliana fought back. You know, she was fighting for her life. She had Rafael's DNA underneath her fingernails and she was also aggressively trying to defend herself and just get Rafael off of her. Rafael's DNA was also found on her body through blood and semen traces. With all of this, there was enough evidence to now arrest Rafael. I mean, the evidence was pretty strong. I mean, there was surveillance footage, there was a witness. Juliana's belongings were literally found inside the penthouse. Her body was literally found there and Rafael's jacket was also found there. Plus, his DNA was found on Juliana. I mean, there was just so much against him. Two days after Juliana was found on December 6, 2016, police went to the clinic where Rafael was still being treated for his overdose and they read him his charges while he just laid in the hospital bed. As he was listening to the charges against him, he actually began to cry and had his hands covering his head. En conformidad con el artículo 303 del Código de Procedimiento Penal, artículo 205 y 211, numeral 7 del Código de Procedimiento Penal. Asimismo, tortura, artículo 178 del Código de Procedimiento Penal. Rafael Uribe Noguera. He was being charged with kidnapping, torture, and with aggravated femicide. When Rafael was finally giving medical clearance to leave the hospital, he was actually transported to a judicial complex in a tank. Outside of the hospital, outraged people were waiting for him and they were wanting to beat him up. They wanted to throw rocks at him. They wanted to throw motorcycle helmets at him. Honestly, they just wanted to grab anything and throw it at the sky because people were just so outraged that this full grown man did this to a seven-year-old little girl. Everyone was just so disgusted by this and people were upset about Juliana's death and they just honestly wanted justice for her. They were making it clear that just because Rafael belonged to a wealthy family, he was not going to get away with it like they've seen happen in so many other cases involving, quote, important people. This was all over the news. It was all over social media. I mean, everyone was talking about this and everyone, again, was just trying to spread awareness to make sure that what happened to to Juliana would not be forgotten. While Rafael was now in custody, the investigation continued. However, on December 9th, 2016, just three days after Rafael was arrested, the security guard, Fernando Merchan Murillo, you know, the witness that saw Francisco and Catalina arrive, the witness that saw Rafael arrive, the witness that saw him drive in the car, everything, was actually found dead in his shower. According to police, Fernando had actually left two suicide notes, but they were not going to rule out foul play. I mean, everybody in the community was already furious about the case, but just to hear that a witness was found dead in his shower from an apparent suicide just made everybody even more angry and just made people feel like, you know, the family was trying to just like sweep this under the rug. So as I mentioned, Fernando left two suicide notes. In the first one, he said that he was innocent, that he was sorry to his children, and that he's sorry that he ruined the holidays for them. In the second letter, he said that he didn't want to go back to jail. So why did he say that? Well, according to his family, he had actually previously served five years for drug drug trafficking. So he just didn't want to go back to jail because he already knew how it would be like. Now his family doesn't really know what to believe. They believe that he could have been silenced, you know, because he was a witness in such an important case. They feel like maybe someone did this to him and just like staged it as a suicide. Or they believe that he could have actually been scared that somehow this very wealthy and, you know, prominent family would pin the entire thing on him since he was the only other person in the building at the time and they knew that he wouldn't be able to to prove his innocence and again he just didn't want to go back to jail so he did actually take his own life or they also believed that maybe he knew what Rafael was doing you know maybe he saw him enter the penthouse with Juliana but didn't stop it and now he just didn't want to be exposed so I don't know there's just a lot of speculation as to what happened to Fernando and whether or not he took his own life eh, lo vi sentado, desgonzado, yo empecé a gritar, no sabía qué hacer porque en ese momento yo estaba sola. Yo sé que mi papá en algún, o sea, fue presionado, presionado por las redes, por el dueño, por, por todo, porque él ya se, él sentía culpabilidad. Eh, encontré dos cartas que estaban en este lado, una decía perdónenme por dañarle la Navidad, y la otra decía, hijitas, María, amigos y familia, 
Perdóneme, eh, yo no quiero volver a la cárcel. Again, it's just speculation, but as of now, police have still not ruled out any foul play. Now, what's shocking is that the next day, there was another death. The second lieutenant of the Chapinero police station that handled Juliana's case, 24-year-old Cristian Camilo Santiago Triana, was found dead with a gunshot wound to the head in the police station's bathroom. The police station declared it as a suicide and... That was that. However, there was no suicide note found, so a lot of people are very confused about this. They just feel like it's very suspicious. I mean, these two very suspicious deaths happened back to back with people directly involved in the case. I mean, the public just saw right through it. To them, it was very clear that these two men were victims of the Nogueira family. Now, I say the family and not just Rafael because as the investigations went on, it extended to Rafael's siblings, Francisco and Catalina. According According to forensics, someone helped Rafael clean the jacuzzi, which had traces of blood, and they also helped move Juliana's body inside the jacuzzi machinery cabinet. So the two siblings were being investigated for their involvement in hiding Juliana's clothes, cleaning the crime scene, deleting text messages and social media accounts from Rafael's phone, as well as her own, and for also withholding knowledge of Rafael's location from authorities during the investigation. If you recall, authorities could not get a hold of Francis from roughly 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., which is when he was in Rafael's penthouse. And if you recall, Juliana's autopsy revealed that she passed away before 3 p.m. So Juliana was already dead when Francisco and Catalina were in the penthouse with Rafael. However, they told police that they didn't find anything, that they were looking around everywhere, but that they didn't find her body. Francisco was a very well-known lawyer in Bogota, and guess who was also a very well-known and respected lawyer? His sister, Catalina. They both had very powerful colleagues who could help them. Now, when the news came out that Rafael's siblings could also be involved, the public just grew even more angry. It was just like one thing after the other after the other. I mean, everyone was just so angry because they knew how this would most likely unfold. You know, all three of these people would just get away unpunished just because they were wealthy. There's actually an old saying that people were using during this time, which was, justice is for poor people. Meaning, that the rich folk always get away with anything and that the only people that are found guilty in the country are poor people who can't escape the law like the wealthy. Francisco's defense team argued that from the moment Rafael confessed to him that he took Juliana, Francisco called police and told them everything he knew. They also argued that the only reason they deleted social media was because of the death threats that they were receiving and because of all the aggressive comments being left, you know, about their family. People were commenting really horrible things, you know, some people were commenting things such as your children will be raped next which is horrible like no one should ever say that about any child now this doesn't explain however why they deleted text messages from Rafael's phone when they were trying to find Rafael the family was actually exchanging text messages which they ended up erasing their defense also argued that they voluntarily went in for questioning after Rafael was arrested and they voluntarily gave their cell phones over to the authorities to you know help with the investigation there was honestly a lot of rumors flying around. A lot of people in the public also felt like maybe Catalina and Francisco had gotten Rafael drunk, that maybe they drugged him. That way he would be like all delirious and stuff. And if he did get caught, defense could say that he wasn't in the right mind when he committed the murder and, and that they could hopefully use that as a defense to help him get away with it. It was also believed that they were the ones who covered the place and Juliana's body in vegetable oil. That way they could get rid of any evidence and that that's why Francisco didn't tell police right away when he found the car and he saw the little girl's shoe inside. There was just so much speculation with this case, you guys. It was crazy. Like, I was going down a deep hole of just, like, reading all these speculations, all these theories, and this was stuff coming from, like, news articles as well, so it wasn't just, like, Reddit theories. Like, everyone was just wondering what actually happened, but again, it was just speculation. None of this has ever been confirmed. So, while the investigation continued on for the siblings, Rafael's trial began. So let's go over it. You know, what exactly happened according to Rafael? Rafael confessed that on the morning of December 4th, he left his apartment in the EQ64 building and drove over to Juliana's neighborhood. If you recall, some of Juliana's neighbors said that they remember Rafael's car in the neighborhood before. Well, it turns out that Rafael went there on three different occasions to try to kidnap Juliana. Yeah, what? 
Like, I just wanted to cry when I heard that. I was like, this guy was stalking her and had been trying to kidnap her. So one time, he even offered her and another little girl money to get inside his car, but Juliana said no. Now, the route to get to Juliana's house is described as like a labyrinth of turns and corners and only someone who has been there before and just like knows the area well can get to Juliana's house. So with this, the prosecutors believe that Rafael had already scoped out the area and just kept returning to try to kidnap Juliana until he finally did on December 4th. Once he had Juliana in the car, he went to the apartments where he lived at around 9.20 in the morning and he was about to enter the parking garage, but then he quickly reversed as if he changed his mind and drove away. In the surveillance footage of Rafael, you know, quickly driving away, police say that they could see Juliana fighting to get loose. But... Rafael, being a full grown man, kept her down out of view of the windows by pushing her down onto his lap and he made her lay down so that she wouldn't be seen. So, Rafael leaves building EQ64 where he lives and he heads over to the vacant apartments with the penthouse which was building EQ66. When he arrives at this building, Rafael parks his car in the basement garage where there are no cameras at the entrance then he goes upstairs to the penthouse. There was actually an elevator in the basement that led him straight to the penthouse floor. At around 11 o'clock in the morning, he received a delivery that he had ordered, which consisted of cigarettes, a lighter, and a bottle of vegetable oil. The delivery man, Luis Alberto, said that Rafael himself received the items that he had ordered and paid for them. 40 minutes later, Rafael left the penthouse and he actually walked back to his apartment where he lived in, which again is building at Q64 to change his clothes and get some more alcohol. Shortly after, he returns to the penthouse with a black backpack. He then drank and drugged himself, and then he essayed Juliana, killed her by covering her mouth and strangling her, and then he said that he kind of just like knocked out from the booze and the drugs, but when he kind of woke up and got himself together, he saw that he had so many missed calls from police and from his siblings, and that's when he called the security guard Fernando and told him to not let anyone up to the penthouse and to not tell anyone, even his siblings, that he was there. Minutos después, o un tiempo después de recibir tantas llamadas, yo decido contestar el celular y es mi hermana Catalina y me dice que, que me está buscando el gaula, que yo dónde estoy. Y yo le miento y le digo que estoy en la casa de una amiga. Recuerdo que el citófono suena también bastantes veces y, y yo contesto y es el portero o el vigilante diciéndome que ya está abajo queriendo subir y yo le digo al vigilante que por favor no la deje subir y que cualquier persona que venga al apartamento le diga que yo no estoy ahí. Then he hid Juliana's clothing inside the toilet chamber and then he hid her body in the jacuzzi machinery compartment. Al ya presentir que en cualquier momento van a llegar al apartamento mis hermanos, yo escondo, eh, alzo el cuerpo de Juliana y, y voy y lo escondo. Antes o después, no recuerdo el orden exactamente, eh, cojo la ropa de ella y la escondo en la cisterna de, del baño principal del apartamento. Veo que el piso está muy, muy engrasado con aceite y, y, y tomo un trapero que hay cerca de la cocina y... After this, he tried cleaning the apartment to get rid of evidence, but there was just vegetable oil everywhere. So after that, then we know what happened. You know, then we know that Catalina showed up. Then we know that Francisco showed up. And then, yeah, that's pretty much what Rafael claims happened the day that he abducted and killed Juliana. He also told the courts that in the taxi after he confessed to Francisco, Francisco actually began crying and he told him that he hated him and that he would die in prison. Francisco told him that he basically just ruined his life. Rafael said that he had never seen his brother with such anger and just like hatred towards him. Rafael was adamant that his siblings did not know about Juliana and that they did not help him get rid of evidence, they didn't help him get rid of her body, nothing. He explained that he did all of this in a quote, 
moment of craziness caused by drugs. Now, Juliana's parents were there when Rafael confessed to all of this. And of course, just listening to this and then seeing all of the evidence being presented with photos and videos was just way too much. I mean, as soon as Nelly heard these details, she actually fainted. I just can't imagine being Juliana's parent or any parent in that matter and listening to the horrific details and the horrific thing that your daughter had to experience before her death. The judge said that it was clear Rafael acted in the right state of mind and that he knew exactly what he was doing. He was trying to blame all of this on alcohol and all of this on drugs, but that's not an excuse. In the end, Rafael was found guilty and he was originally sentenced to only 52 years in prison, but it was later increased to 58 years. Now, in Colombia, life sentences do not exist and 60 years is basically the maximum that you can receive, which is crazy to me. Like, I'm sorry, what? He literally abducted assaulted, tortured, and did horrible, horrible things to a seven-year-old little girl, and he's only going to serve 58 years. I don't know. I just don't feel like that's fair. After his sentencing, Rafael actually wrote an apology letter, and in the letter, he started with, quote, Dear loved ones, with all my heart and all my love, I'm sorry for the 4th of December of 2016. He then went on to say that he's sorry for the suffering of the Samboni family and how he wishes that people realize the harm drugs and alcohol can do and says that the biggest mistake in his life was using drugs and alcohol and how he hasn't been able to escape that hell. So even in this supposed apology letter, he is basically still blaming drugs and alcohol for what he did. Now, as for the other female clothes that were found inside the toilet chamber along with Juliana's clothes, I wasn't able to find any new information on that. As of today, Rafael is currently being held at one of the highest security prisons in Colombia, where very dangerous criminals are at and where Pablo Escobar and Alfredo Garavito had previously been at. He's actually been receiving so many threats that he actually can't be with other prisoners. He also has a very small individual cell, which I will include photos of. As I mentioned, Rafael was sentenced to 58 years in prison, but then he managed to knock off a year, two months, and 18 days through good behavior and labor, which I'm just like, bro, this guy like doesn't even deserve that. Like No matter what his behavior is or what he does in prison, I just don't feel like he should get any leniency at all. In prison, he spends his days pretty much just working on architectural blueprints. He actually wrote a letter with a list of requests to help him last through his sentence in this, quote, hell prison. Now, this prison is very humid and it's just very hot and it just feels like you're basically suffocating in there and there's basically no air circulation in the cells and even worse, it's just like very stinky and like smelly 24 seven since it's right next to the city's trash dump. Rafael says that he's just very uncomfortable in prison. Some of his requests include, quote, an orthopedic mattress, painting his cell, and he also requested to play sports to renew his spirit. Yeah, he wants to paint his cell. Like, what is this guy talking about? The absolute crazy thing is that there was actually a support group made in favor of Rafael. Like, what? There was actually multiple with names such as Free Rafael and I believe Rafael Uribe. People were literally defending this man. Like, why? Why are you defending him? As for his siblings, Francisco and Catalina, they were exonerated of any involvement in the crime as of 2019. They hugged each other and they were released when they heard the judge say that and they say that they were innocent from the beginning and that they corroborated with police from the very start. They say that their brother is the only person who was involved in the death and in the hiding of Juliana's body and that it's been unfair that the media has placed the whole family as accomplices to Juliana's murder. Francisco told the media, quote, what happened to me and my family is something that I believe no human is prepared for. We have been accused on numerous occasions of altering the crime scene, of washing the girl's body, of putting oil all over her to erase evidence, and of getting my brother drunk and drugging him. The truth is that neither myself nor Catalina saw the girl's body. Everyone who thinks that you can act logical and rational in a moment like this hasn't lived what we have. Now, they actually ended up having to move out of their homes because of the amount of death threats that they were receiving, and Francisco was actually fired from the law firm he worked at for 18 years, because now the law firm
Cameron was being dragged and accused of being involved. The people of Colombia have, you know, split opinions. A lot of people are empathetic with the family because they were dragged into something horrible by their brother's horrendous actions, and others think that they were 100% involved and that they managed to get away with it. So there's very split opinions. As for Juliana's family, they held a funeral for her, which was guarded by police, and the family actually asked that no news outlets disturb them on this very hard day that they had to go through. Hundreds of people gathered to say their goodbyes to Juliana and to show their support for the family. After the funeral, Juliana's body was taken to her hometown of El Cauca to be buried. The family actually ended up moving back there because they just wanted to escape what happened and they kind of just wanted like a fresh start. Juvencio said that he still hasn't accepted the fact that he won't get to hug his daughter ever again or just ever see or speak to her. Juliana's baby brother was born and they named him Julian Andres in honor of Juliana Andrea. They live their life every day in honor of her and they go visit her grave to clean it, to leave flowers, leave gifts for her, to speak to her, and just spend time with her. Juliana's mom, Nelly, hasn't really done any interviews, but Juvencio says that they are just focusing on living their life and just being there for their other children and again, just trying to provide them with the best life possible despite what happened to their sister, Juliana. They have a corner of their home, you know, that they have dedicated to her with a large photo of her and just like a little table with like candles and photos and flowers with her on it. Nicole says that she misses her sister so much. Unfortunately, Juvencio has struggled to get work because in their hometown of Cauca, people think that the family received like all of this money from the death of Juliana, but they never did. The only help that they ended up getting was from the Ministry of Agriculture. They were given 30 chickens, some bags of cement, and 200 bricks to make a ranch to raise chickens and like live off of that. Rafael did have to pay a fine for what he did, but but none of that money was given to the family. It was all given to the government. Regardless, the family says that they don't even want money. You know, their deep-rooted beliefs and cultural traditions played a very significant role in their decision-making process following Juliana's tragic passing. They believe that money and children just like can't go together and if they were to accept like any money from Rafael's family or from anyone else, they feel like in a way they would kind of be selling or exchanging their daughter for money. Their lawyers tried to tell them that that's not, you know, what's happening, that they're not selling their daughter by accepting money, that it's just a compensation for what they went through and that it will help them get through, you know, difficult times and, you know, help them raise their other children. But as of now, the family has not wanted to pursue any type of monetary compensation for what happened to them. It's honestly all just a very sad and just disturbing case and it just stuck with me because what the heck, you guys? Like, this guy looks so normal, which I know, like, monsters come in every shape and every form and they don't always have to look like a gross guy hiding in their basement to be a predator but still like the fact that this guy has nieces and he just looks like a regular guy but yet he was probably stalking this seven-year-old little girl for days you know since he had tried to abduct her three times before it's honestly so freaking frightening and it just makes you scared of humanity like how did he even find her you know how did he come across her in the first place also the fact that he put a bow on her a red bow on her torso what the heck is up with that like it's honestly just so scary i can't believe this happened to this beautiful seven-year-old little girl who had her entire life ahead of her. She was just a little girl playing outside with her cousin, just trying to be a child. And this man had to come in and take her life and just ruin everyone else's lives. My heart is just heavy for the family and how they have to live without her and how the family's dream of building a better life in Bogota is no longer possible. I truly hope that they do find peace and I just send them my deepest sympathies. I hope Juliana is resting peacefully. I'm glad that, you know, in a way she did get justice and that this isn't one of those cases where the wealthy did get away with it. Although, as I mentioned, a lot of people feel as if his siblings did get away with it, that 
they did help him that they did have something to do with this but i don't know i would definitely love to know what you guys think about this down below thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to juliana i do feel that because of all the pressure that the citizens of colombia put on the government and put on the court system to get this right and to not let this man get away with it and to not let the wealthy win for once honestly helped push the case you know all the marches all the rallies everything just helped the government and just everybody know like hey we're not going to forget about this we are not going to forget about what happened to juliana and we're not going to stop until she receives justice that's why it's so important to spread awareness and to be vocal about your opinion because it does have effect and you know it can make changes so i don't know this case was just so hard to talk about so yeah that's pretty much everything i have to share with you guys today definitely let me know your thoughts down below and yeah i will see you all in my next video bye everyone